We are the voices. You are with the captain. It's Mr. Midday. 12 new major news. The big station. The morning show. The number one song. The faces. You're watching Bermuda tonight. This is exactly what you're talking about. What an upset it was. The storytellers. They are actually using the pepper spray. Police are aware of this theory. The water is three and a half thousand meters deep. The tax climbs up to 12 and a half percent. The window on our community. We bring you the best in U.S. television entertainment and the greatest sporting events in the world. A brilliant performance of Duffy. We are the island's only Bermudian-owned broadcaster of both television and radio. With the only TV channels that are available over the air in beautiful high definition, completely free. We are always expanding. We are always innovating. And most important, we're always your station. This is Bermuda Broadcasting. You're watching Bermuda Tonight is Monday, the 13th of August. I'm Diane Brewer, and thank you for joining us tonight. And we begin with two court stories. An American cruise ship passenger has been charged with sexual assault, while magistrates have sentenced a Devonshire man to jail after he needlessly set off a fire alarm in the magistrate's court building, causing a mass evacuation. Jasmine Patterson has the details. Appearing in magistrate's court, a 27-year-old New Jersey man pleaded not guilty to sexually assaulting a female passenger on board a cruise ship in Sands on August 10th this year. The complainant has left the jurisdiction. The man, who cannot be named for legal reasons, was granted bail in the amount of $10,000 and was ordered to surrender his travel documents to the court. The matter is due to return on August 29th. Elsewhere, 54-year-old Jerry Williams of Devonshire was sentenced to six months imprisonment for attempting to pervert the course of justice by pulling a fire alarm inside the Dame Lewis Brown Evans building on August 10th this year. Prosecutors say the building was placed on lockdown, disrupting the court and police activities of the day, but firefighters later determined there was no threat of a fire. Investigators spoke with security officers who said they overheard a man identified as Williams say, I'm going to pull the fire alarm as he was attending his court trial. Officers later found him sitting in an empty courtroom after the building was cleared of people and he was subsequently arrested. Williams explained in court that he acted as a hero because he saw a man with what looked like a Molotov cocktail bomb inside the court and a lighter in his hand and also smelt of petrol. His concern fell on deaf ears, however, so he says he pulled the alarm to, quote, save lives. He added, this is a simple case of the hero becoming the villain. I'm proud of what I've done. Maybe he could have doused himself. Magistrate Kamisa Jacumbo asked why William did not tell officers about the man with the Molotov cocktail bomb when he was arrested. And he replied, I didn't like the way they handled me. Mr. Tacumbo said, you don't appear to be credible, and noted William's previous conviction of a similar offense in 2013. He jailed Williams for six months and to, quote, send a message to any others who would do this. Jasmine Patterson reporting for Bermuda Broadcasting News. Thanks, Jasmine. Well, by now, we've all heard the news about the positive economic performance by the island during the first quarter of this year. More people employed, air arrivals up, and lower government spending. David Berthy, Premier and Finance Minister, is very confident about these statistics. But our Gary Moreno asked him whether his confidence was premature, given the results are based on the figures from a single quarter. Here's how the Premier looks at it. Revenues are up. Expenses are down, the deficit is down, tourism is up, and the number of people working in the economy is up. But you're basing all of this confidence on, on the performance of one quarter. Mm -hmm. And I think in my statement, I said one quarter does not a year make. But I think what is most important to recognize is when there is as much noise as there may be that may be coming from different quarters inside the public, talking about how we may not be making our revenue, how the government may be overspending, I thought it was important that the public be provided with the facts. The facts are that we are, um, our revenue is up. The facts are that our expenditure year over year is down. The fact is that the deficit is narrowing. And the fact is that tourism increased in the second quarter of last year even more than the quarter that we had the America's Cup. 
In addition to that, the figures indicate that there's 322 more people working in the economy this year than there were at the same time last year. How sustainable is this kind of performance? Well, I think that we will see an increase um, performance as time goes on. I think that from the perspective of where the government is, we are being very prudent insofar as what we're doing to make sure that we can have growth. There will be some growth inside the insurance industry. There will certainly be some growth inside of the digital asset industry. Um, and then we'll look to uh, accelerate some infrastructure projects with the um, advent of the Bermuda Infrastructure Fund. But how many of the jobs being created are sustainable over the long term? It's a question Gary also put to Mr. Bird. Well, I think what's most important when we talk about whether it be construction or whether we talk about other jobs, the most important thing is that we have an economy that is continually growing. So there is that type of continued activity. If we look at what the work that we want to do with the Bermuda Infrastructure Fund, talking about water and sewage, making sure that we take care of those issues, those are going to be long-term jobs that will be created even after the short-term infrastructure work is put into place. So those are important things going forward. So from the government's perspective, again, I want wanted to make sure that the public were aware of what the facts were. A lot of, there's a lot of noise. The facts are, as I said, revenues up, expenditure down, deficit down, tourism up, and job numbers are up. We'll have more for you after this short break, including a special report asking why Bermuda doesn't make more use of the island's abundant solar energy. That story in just a few minutes. At Big Saving Zone, we believe your children deserve a happy space to call their own. Full of color and excitement, where their imagination can take flight from fun to functional, we have a delightful selection of kids' furniture built with the same quality that you've come to know and trust at our everyday low prices. Create a room that your little ones will love only at Big Saving Zone. Open Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Located in the Commercial Park, Southside, St. David. Call 297-4440 or click BigSavingZone.com. Big Saving Zone, making your house a home. If you would have came to me a year ago and told me that you could reverse my diabetes, I'd have been skeptical. I have come off my medication. I'm fine. My eyesight is gradually coming back. And if you can control this disease, you can reduce the likelihood of having blindness. You can reduce the likelihood of amputation. You can reduce the likelihood of having dialysis. Would this mean it's a perfect cure-all for everybody? No. This is one piece of a larger puzzle. Physicians, they do care about you, but I think this one went the extra mile. I'm here to tell you that it works. Call Dr. James, ask him for help. Don't be afraid. As Bermudians, we got too much pride, and we're killing ourselves with food. Just come if you have diabetes and you'd like to take control of it. This just might be the program for you. A man was hospitalized with severe leg injuries after a four-vehicle crash this morning. It happened around 7.30 a.m. on Somerset Road in Sands, just west of the St. James Church. A car was attempting to negotiate a right-hand turn onto Church Hill Place when a man on a motorcycle, also traveling west, collided with the car and with two motorcycles that were stationary in the eastbound lane. The rider was the only person badly hurt. The crash caused major traffic delays during rush hour. Witnesses should call Sergeant Andrew Harewood on 717-2168 or the main police telephone number at 295-0011. Well, it's plentiful, cheap, and increasingly popular around the world, while Bermuda's climate would seem to make it almost ideal, but the island has made only limited steps towards generating power using solar panels in recent years. And some argue it's actually gone backwards, Hal Davis reports in the first of two special reports on solar power. There were hopes that well over 10% of the island's homes, 5,000 of them, would be using solar panels like these by the end of the decade. That target from a 2011 government white paper on energy use was missed by a significant margin. Fewer than 1,000 homes have any sort of rooftop solar. To date, we haven't done very well at all. If you are grading, it would probably be an E or close to an F. That's despite an incentive scheme set up in 2010 to encourage the use of the panels. Under it, Belco paid 34 cents a kilowatt hour for excess power produced by solar panels. So each of these devices is on a network. 
Damien Wilson was one of those who took advantage, and for a year his highly sophisticated system enabled him to sell his power at a profit to Belco. It wasn't his main motivation. These batteries give him security of supply, meaning he shouldn't ever suffer a power cut. But two years ago that rate was cut in half to just 17 cents a kilowatt hour. Wilson says he noticed the number of people who were interested in adopting solar power swiftly dropped. The evidence is there. Adoption rate nosedived, and it runs counter to what the world is doing. So it's having a you know, deleterious effect on, on that industry, and as a consequence, the adoption of this free energy from the sky. He's backed up by the head of one of the biggest companies fitting solar panels on the island. Being able to finance solar is so important, and you need a good payback in order to finance it. So when the rates were cut, it effectively meant that um, those people on the middle and lower income brackets were pretty much excluded from the solar opportunity, which is really frustrating. Belco admits it did push the then regulator to cut the tariff rate. It says solar customers were benefiting at the expense of others. There's a small number of renewable customers that are getting the benefit of retail sale back to the company, uh, and that's not a, an accurate reflection of, of what the rate should be. So the broader customer base end up subsidizing that amount. So the, the reduction in the tariff brings it more in line with what, what should be on par for that, for that energy cost at, at the renewable customer. Whatever the rights and wrongs of the decision, what's clear is that Bermuda is falling far behind other comparable countries in its adoption of renewables. Jamaica's government has pledged that 30% of its energy needs will be met by renewable energy by 2030, while Aruba has a target of 100% by 2020. Bermuda's current installed capacity is less than 10%, two-thirds of which comes from the Tynes Bay Waste Energy Plant. The government admits more investment is needed, it's already signed an agreement to develop a major solar plant at the piece of land known as the Finger near the airport. The government acknowledges that more needs to be done to boost domestic solar as well, with a lower tariff failing to encourage people. The matter for the rates such as the feed-in tariff is a matter for the regulatory authority. It's not the government that actually deals with that directly. But right now there is a feed-in tariff which has been set. We're not really happy with that tariff because when we, it is our view that it does not encourage the uptake of solar technology. With the regulatory authority currently looking at what that rate should be, advocates of solar power are hoping it heads more towards its former rate. For its part, the government says it wants to spread the benefits to lower income households. And in the second of our series on solar power, we'll be looking into how it hopes to achieve that. Howell Davis, Bermuda Broadcasting News. Thanks, Hal. Weather now and another hot, humid day today. Will we see any change in the next few days? Here's AccuWeather with a forecast. AccuWeather is presented by BFNM Insurance Group. We now go to AccuWeather headquarters. This AccuWeather forecast here on ZBM is brought to us by our friends at the BFNM Insurance Group. And we have a pretty decent weather pattern here for the work week. Most of the time it will be dry and fairly pleasant out there. Water is warm, 86 degree water temperature. So that bumped up a couple degrees since last week. Uh, and you can see that there is some area of cloud cover to our north and west, but it's a good distance away, so we really don't have too many concerns. And as uh, we uh, step deeper into the evening, the weather should be fairly quiet. We are keeping an eye on a disturbance way off to our northeast, uh, and you can see some agitated weather up that way. Uh, a little farther north, there is uh, an area of low pressure, but it is so far removed from us that we don't expect it to really impact us, and it's not very developed in the first place. As we look at the current temps, 84s and 85s across the island. We're in good shape. The humidity is holding at 73%. Pretty active breeze from the west at 8 to 12 knots. Just enough to keep some of the western waters a little more agitated. Two to four foot waves out that way. On the inside of the reef, though, we're dealing with pretty flat water. Only a foot or less. So a nice evening for maybe a little kayak journey or something like that. Upcoming tides, uh, the tide is going to be coming back in all evening, and high tide is at 11.11. Low tide early tomorrow morning, another high tide right in the middle of the day tomorrow, 11.37 uh, a.m. As we look at the overnight forecast, we'll go with a mainly clear sky, just a few occasional clouds, fairly warm out there, 78 degrees, no complaints, kind of warm out there though. And then tomorrow we're back up to 86 with a mostly sunny and really nice weather pattern, just a light breeze. So there's a beefy Bermuda Azores high right to our south 
and uh, it is our namesake. It's often camped out somewhere in our part of the Atlantic, and it's just off to our south. So that's really protecting us from the bulk of the moisture. You can see a lot of that's being funneled well off to the north and uh, northwest of our location, closer to the Carolina coast. So we don't expect to see much chance for rain. Here we go through Tuesday evening, and we're holding on to the pleasant weather out uh, through that time frame. Small, small chance of a stray sprinkle or two later this week. We won't really uh, be too concerned about that, though, as um, it will be short-lived and very spotty. So most of us hold on to dry weather for each of the next five days. Gateway forecast for eastern North America and London. We have them in there as well. Spotty showers, a couple of thunderstorms in New York and Boston, a very un, uh, unsettled weather pattern for anybody traveling into the middle Atlantic states or the northeastern United States. Toronto is kind of on the edge of some of that. Uh, into Atlanta, a warm time, 91. Miami, 90 with scattered thunderstorms. That's business as usual this time of the year there. And across uh, to the east into London, 79, a mix of sun and clouds, a nice summer day there in the United Kingdom. Current conditions down into the Caribbean and uh, the forecast over the next couple of days will be somewhat repetitive, scattered showers and some spotty thunderstorms. Barbados is a drier spot right now. We are keeping an eye on that area of low pressure far to our northeast. It's probably not going to become much more of a factor in our forecast, though, even if it does become a subtropical storm, and even that's a small chance. So we'll hold on to dry, bright, beautiful weather for the most part. It's warm out there, 86s, 87s. Water temp is up. Enjoy the ride. Back to you. AccuWeather was presented by BF&M Insurance Group. I was diagnosed with uh, illness, very frightening because my son had just turned one and it was a cancer. So I'm young, new baby, and I needed to get the care that I knew would be definitive so that I wanted to be around for him for a very long time. I got in contact with BFNM and BFNM was able to commit at that time to doing at least 50% so we were comfortable, okay, well we're going to go. Uh, we got off the plane actually the day of the procedure and on my way to the limo, my case manager called and she says, Kiana, we got it, you're covered at 100%. And I cried all the way to the office because I was just so happy. The BFNM difference is that I really felt that the case manager really was concerned about my overall care. And because of that, I really appreciated them. I think that personal care, that willingness to listen, and then to work until they were able to get it so that I could get full coverage really made the difference for me. This is Jane. Jane has been living independently until her recent fall. Because of the injury she sustained, her mobility is now limited. Jane chose Bermuda Inn Home Care to assist her with her activities of daily living. The caregivers at Bermuda Inn Home Care are trained to care for individuals with limited mobility. They incorporate exercise and activities into Jane's care plan given by her doctor and physiotherapist. The caregiver helps the family select the right medical equipment from Lighthouse Medical Supplies. Lighthouse Medical Supplies have certified durable medical equipment specialists available to help. Falls are the number one cause of injury in older adults. Falls lead to head injuries and hip fractures. Fall prevention is critical. Call Bermuda in Home Care to speak to one of our home care specialists. Call us now for a free home care assessment, 705-4424, or visit us at www.bermudainhomecare.com. Welcome back. Well, after many decades of service, including 21 years at Christ Church Devonshire, Canon James Francis recently left the pulpit for the last time. It's a well-earned retirement for the charismatic churchman who will turn 90 next month. He talked to Bermuda Broadcasting's Mike Sharp about the calling he felt at just 10 years old and why he found being chairman of the Human Rights Commission was one of the highlights of his long career. Canon Francis... What, was, what would you say is the highlight of being the chairman of that Human Rights Commission? I think the major accomplishment was that we had a very good director in terms of uh, Ken Dill. Uh, he was the director at the time. And um, we also had Bobby Barrett, who was the minister at the time. And I think we were all concerned about the fact that the Human Rights Commission or Human Rights Laws uh, dealt only with the private sector. And we, we needed to bring the public on. So 
one of the major things we did was have meetings and held a big workshop at the college to just lay it out in terms of what can be expected, uh, what will it cover. Uh, we got out um, a buy-in from the entire community and we were able to pass that, that law that includes everybody, government included. And that thing was, was, was the, the discrimination had ended. You've had successful years at the Anglican Church, but they say in other churches membership is declining, but yet yours is, church is bubbling. What do you say to that? Attendance and involvement. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, people talk about Jesus being a really nice uh, uh, leader and walks around, and they, they try to find out what, what is the true, uh, the, the role of a leader. Most people think the role of a leader is to lead, that is to talk and to direct and the rest of it. The role of a good leader is to listen. Jesus didn't talk much. He listened a lot to people. He heard them speaking even when they went, their lips weren't moving. He heard their heart. And the key to any uh, success on any business, be it church, religion, whatever it is, you have to have somebody who can listen and respond to what people need. Not what you think and not what you feel, but what is it they're asking of you? What is it they need? Respond to that and you've got your followers. And that's what Jesus did. I understand, Canon Francis, there's a young dynamic minister uh, that you took under the wing um, that is doing some things in Bermuda. Who is this gentleman and what do you think about him? His first thing is to get through uh, uh, to get into some church, and uh, there's a little bit, there's a bit of mix up on that, and I, I, I hope that we can sort it out. The bishop is young, uh, the bishop is uh, sincere. He really wants the church to grow, but we are guarded by constitutions, by canon laws, and sometimes we jump ahead. I believe the bishop sort of made a little jump ahead that we're going to have to suggest come back a bit, take a look at what it is required in order to fill a vacancy. Christ Church is your vibrant church. And so you need to take care of that first. This young man came to us about, um, I would say he's probably had about seven years, seven years of training, including three years of one of the best schools, having received a Masters of Divinity from one of the best schools. So he's done his homework. Uh, the question is, can he do this job? I don't know. But we need to find out by advertising this position and let people apply Mm -hmm. and then judge him based on his ability or lack of it thereof to have this job. Mike Sharp reporting for Bermuda Broadcasting News. And in the second part of our profile of Kenan Francis, we'll hear about his views on same-sex marriage and find out what he thinks is the greatest accomplishment of his long career. Still to come, Earl Bazin will have all the latest in sports news. That's in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Bermuda. Join us at the Snorkel Park Beach and Bermuda's favorite old school DJs for a fun night of dancing under the stars to the best of old school R&B, house, soul, reggae, soca, calypso, pop, hip hop, and more. It's Sonic Gold Saturday. The grown up party, the big people party, dressed smart and sexy with a spectacular DJ lineup. It's Mikey B. Now come Lethal Weapon Smith, CJ Iceman, Mark Juggling Jason and yours truly, the Matrix Ninja Cutty. I will be there with special live performances by Reggae Sensation Mox. Gate open 8 p.m. Admission is free before 10. Ten dollars after. So get there early. Snorkel Park Beach, Solid Gold. Saturdays. DJ lineup for August the 18th. Malcolm Lethal Weapon Smith, Iceman, Marky T, and Ninja Cutty. See you there. Bermuda Broadcasting Company is pleased to present the second round of the 115th Annual Eastern Counties Cup Competition featuring defending champions Cleveland County Cricket Club and challengers Flats Victoria Cricket Club at the Seabreeze Oval, Bailey's Bay. Join the island's leading cricket commentary team of Aaron Richardson, Wendell Smith, and Dwayne Slovo Levrock with live ball-by-ball -ball coverage. Saturday, August 18th, starting at 9.45 a.m. on Power 95 FM, the island's number one station for your Eastern County Cup competition. Brought to you by Lindo's Group of companies john barrett and son limited polaris holdings and money shop
sports now. And as ever, Earl Baston has all the latest headlines for us. History was made yesterday as the Bermuda Under-15 Women's National Team defeated Grenada in Florida during the CONCACAF Under-15 Division II Championship match. Co-captain Cora Goodchild summed up the tournament this way. Overall, the tournament was a huge success, I believe. We went through all our group games um, undefeated, and I believe that we were able to do this because we stuck together and we... Um, remembered what we did in our training and we stayed together and we played as a team. And I, overall, there were a little knocks and bruises, but I believe our girls, they stood strong and they fought through it and they didn't give up. And the Junior Caribbean Cycling Championships came to an end in Devonshire yesterday with a road race that saw Bermuda collect five medals on the day. Bermuda cyclists once again won all three categories. Matthew Oliveira won the Junior 17-18 to race, while Nicholas Narraway claimed the Juvenile 15-16 to title. Alyssa Rouse would win the Junior Women's race. Ziani Burgesson was also on the podium when he finished third in the Juvenile 15-16 to race, while Caden Hopkins finished third in the Junior 17-18 to division. The day before, it was the Junior Caribbean Cycling Championship time trial in the East End. Bermuda Cyclists won all three races with Caden Hopkins winning the Junior 17 to 18 race. Nicholas Narraway claimed the 15 to 16 juvenile race. And Alyssa Rouse would win the Junior Women's race. Three Bermuda athletes began battling out for world titles as the BizFed 2018 World Bocce Championships got underway in Liverpool. Yushay De Silva Andrade, Steve Wilson and Omar Hayward competed on day one. In his first individual BC4 division match, Wilson went down 4-1 to one to his opponent from Brazil. Wilson would then fall 6-1 to one to a Croatia competitor. Hayward, making his debut at the world championship level, won his first match, defeating his Thailand opponent 5-2 in their individual BC1 division battle. Competing in the individual BC2 division, De Silva Andrade went down 8-0 to, to her Spain opponent. Jamaican Ramon Bailey, for a second competition in a row, snatched a medal from Tyrone Smith. It was during the CAC Games in Colombia when Bailey snatched a gold medal from Smith on his final attempt. This time, during the 2018 NACAC Championships in Toronto, Bailey snatched a bronze medal away from Smith on his final attempt. During the NACAC Championships, men's long jump, with his final leap, Bailey was measured at 8.09 meters. This measurement pushed Smith into fourth place with a top leap of 7. 7.98 meters. Tiara De Rosa, also competing in Toronto, finished sixth in the women's discus. She had a top toss of 43.01 meters. Tahira Butterfield finished fifth in heat one of the women's 100 meter dash, stopping the clock in 12.22. Dej Miners would finish tenth in the men's 800 meter race. He was clocked at 153.10. On Saturday at the Southampton Oval, the Western County Cup holders, Southampton Rangers, defeated Willowcutts by 57 runs. Southampton batting first were built out for 210 with Kwame Tucker, the top scorer with 78. Shaquille Bean was the pick of the Willowcutts bowlers with 8.5 overs, one maiden, four for 41. In reply, Willowcutts were built out for 153. Kamal Bashir was their top scorer with 29, while Hassan Dorm was the pick of the Southampton Rangers bowlers with figures of nine overs, one maiden, three for 13. Also on Saturday, the 2020 tournament got underway in the Premier Division, with St. George's picking up a 13-run victory over Bailey's Bay. Yesterday saw the Bermuda Cricket Board's Premier Division Championship take place, where St. David's defeated defeated Southampton Rangers by four wickets. Southampton Rangers batted first at the Wellington Oval and were bowled out for 156. Ricardo Brangman was the top scorer with 65. CJ Otterbridge was the pick of the St. David's Cricket Club bowlers with figures of 8.4 overs, 3 for 31. In reply, St. David's would score 161 for 6. Rudolph Pitcher was their top scorer on 45 not out. Malachi Jones was the pick of the Southampton Rangers bowlers with figures of 9 overs, 1 maiden, 4 for 21. Flax Victoria were crowned the first division championship winners with an 88-run victory over Cleveland County. This match played at St. John's Field. Flats batted first and scored 223 for nine. Kamal Leverock was their top scorer with 68, while Makai Young was the pick of the Cleveland County bowlers with figures of nine overs, one maiden, six for 33. Young also led Cleveland County in the batting department, scoring 49. Nelson Baskin was the pick of the Flats Victoria bowlers with figures of seven overs, one maiden, four for 16. 
The 2018 Rubis Around the Island Powerboat Race saw David Sally and Matthew Smith dominate the A-Class and took class honors as well as setting a A-Class record plucking 55-11. The B-Class saw Quincy Dowling and Ty Bean power their boat to the class line honors, stopping the clock in a time of 57-02. Despite incurring a nine-minute penalty assessed due to an incorrect start in the D-Class, Godfrey Willoughby and Makinda Johansson crossed the line in a time of one hour, five minutes, and 43 seconds to take the line honors. Andrew Cunningham and Henry Tobit clocked a time of 40.09 to claim the S-Class honors. The Bermuda Football Association hosted their second corporate beach football tournament at the Horseshoe Bay Beach on Saturday. Athletic OCP were crowned the champions after defeating defending champions KPMG 3-2 in the final. I'm Earl Baisden with Bermuda Broadcasting Sports. Thanks, Earl. And tomorrow, Earl will be providing special live coverage of the Bermuda women's under-15 team as they arrive back on the island following their victory at the CONCACAF Championship. That'll start around 2 p.m. on TV7. Please join us for that. That's it from us for tonight. I'm Diane Brewer. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.